Jia or Jia Arabic, Jitgizya IPA, D, Zia, Ottoman Turkish, G Sizi is a per capita yearly tax historically levied on non Muslim subjects, called the Dhimma, permanently residing in Muslim lands governed by Islamic law. Muslim jurists required adult, free, sane males among the Dhimma community to pay the jiyya, while exempting women, children, elders, handicapped, the ill, the insane, monks, hermits, slaves, and mustamans non Muslim foreigners who only temporarily reside in Muslim lands. Dhimmas who chose to join military service were also exempted from payment, as were those who could not afford to pay. The Quran and Hadiths mention jiyya without specifying its rate or amount. However, scholars largely agree that early Muslim rulers adapted existing systems of taxation and tribute that were established under previous rulers of the conquered lands, such as those of the Byzantine and Sasanian empires. The application of jiyya varied in the course of Islamic history. Together with Karaj, a term that was sometimes used interchangeably with jiyya, taxes levied on non-Muslim subjects were among the main sources of revenues collected by some Islamic polities, such as the Ottoman Empire. Jiyya rate was usually a fixed annual amount depending on the financial capability of the payer. Sources comparing taxes levied on Muslims and jiyya differ as to their relative burden depending on time, place, specific taxes under consideration, and other factors. Historically, the jiyya tax has been understood in Islam as a fee for protection provided by the Muslim ruler to non Muslims, for the exemption from military service for non Muslims, for the permission to practice a non Muslim faith with some communal autonomy in a Muslim state, and as material proof of the non-Muslims' submission to the Muslim state and its laws. Jiyya has also been understood by some as a ritual humiliation of the non-Muslims in a Muslim state for not converting to Islam, while others argue that if it were meant to be a punishment for the dhimmis unbelief then monks and the clergy wouldn't have been exempted. The term appears in the Quran referring to a tax or tribute from people of the book specifically Jews and Christians. Followers of other religions like Zoroastrians and Hindus too were later integrated into the category of Dhimmis and required to pay jiyya. In the Indian subcontinent the practice was eradicated by the 18th century. It almost vanished during the 20th century with disappearance of Islamic states and spread of religious tolerance. The tax is no longer imposed by nation states in the Islamic world, although there are reported cases of organizations such as the Pakistani Taliban and ISIS attempting to revive the practice. Some modern Islamic scholars have argued that jiyya should be paid by non Muslim subjects of an Islamic state, offering different rationales. For example, Saeed Qutb saw it as punishment for polytheism while Abdul Rahman Doi viewed it as a counterpart of the zakat tax paid by Muslims. According to Khalid Abu Lfadl, moderate Muslims reject the Dhimma system, which encompasses jiyya, as inappropriate for the age of nation states and democracies, while scholars like Abu Hanifa and Abu Yusuf stated that jiyya should be imposed on all non Muslims without distinction. Some later and more extremist jurists do not permit jiyya for idolaters and instead only allowed the choice of conversion to avoid death. Topic. Etymology and meaning Commentators disagree on the definition and derivation of the word jiyya. Shakir's English translations of the Quran render jiyya as tax, while Pickthall and Arbery translate it as tribute. Yusuf Ali prefers to transliterate the term as jiyya. Yusuf Ali considered the root meaning of jiyya to be compensation, whereas Muhammad Asad considered it to be satisfaction. 
Al Raghib al Isfahani, d. a classical Muslim lexicographer, points out that derivates of the word jiyya appear in some Quranic verses, such as, such is the reward of those who purify themselves, Q20 while those who believed and did good deeds will have the best of rewards, Q18 and the retribution for an evil act is an evil one like it, but whoever pardons and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from God Q42 to 40 and will reward them for what they patiently endured with a garden in paradise and silk garments Q76 to 12 and be repaid only according to your deeds Q37 to 39 and he writes about Jia a tax that is levied on Dimas and it is so named because it is in return for the protection they are guaranteed Muhammad Abdul Halim states that the term poll tax does not translate the Arabic word jiyya, being also inaccurate in light of the exemptions granted to children, women, etc. Unlike a poll tax, which by definition is levied on every individual poll equals head regardless of gender, age, or ability to pay. He further adds that the root verb of jia is jzy, which means to reward somebody for something, to pay what is due in return for something, and adds that it is in return for the protection of the Muslim state with all the accruing benefits and exemption from military service, and such taxes on Muslims as zakat. The historian al-Tabari and the Hadith scholar al-Bayhachi relate that some members of the Christian community asked Umar ibn al-Khattab if they could refer to the jiyya as sadaqah, literally, charity, which he agreed to. Based on this historical event, the majority of jurists from Shafi is, Hanafis and Hanbalis state that it is lawful to take the jiyya from Ahl al dhimma by name of zakat or sadaqah, meaning it isn't necessary to call the tax that is taken from them by jiyya, and also based on the known legal maxim that states, consideration is granted to objectives and meanings and not to terms and specific wordings. According to Lane's lexicon, jiyya is the tax that is taken from the free non-Muslim subjects of an Islamic government, whereby they ratify the pact that ensures them protection. Michael G. Maroney states that the emergence of "...protected status and the definition of jiyya as the poll tax on non-Muslim subjects appears to have been achieved only by the early 8th century." This came as a result of growing suspicions about the loyalty of the non-Muslim population during the Second Civil War and of the literalist interpretation of the Quran by pious Muslims." Jane Damon McAuliffe states that jiyya, in early Islamic texts, was an annual tribute expected from non-Muslims, and not a poll tax. Similarly, Thomas Walker Arnold writes that jiyya originally denoted tribute of any type paid by the non-Muslim subjects of the Arab Empire, but that it came later on to be used for the capitation tax, as the fiscal system of the new rulers became fixed. Arthur Stanley Tritton states that both jiyya in West, and Karaj in the East Arabia meant tribute. It was also called Jawali in Jerusalem. Shemesh says that Abu Yusuf, Abu Ubaid, Qudama, Khatib and Yahya used the terms jiyya, Karaj, Ushr and Task as synonyms. Anne Lambton writes that the origins of jiyya are extremely complex, regarded by some jurists as "...compensation paid by non-Muslims for being spared from death," and by others as "...compensation for living in Muslim lands." Topic. Rationale Most Muslim jurists and scholars regard the jiyya as a special payment collected from certain non-Muslims in return for the responsibility of protection fulfilled by Muslims against any type of aggression, as well as for non-Muslims being exempt from military service, and in exchange for the suppliance of poor dimas. In a treaty made by Khalid with some towns in the neighborhood of Hira, he writes, "...if we protect you, then jiyya is due to us, but if we do not, then it is not due." 
Early Hanafi jurist Abu Yusuf writes, After Abu Ubaidah concluded a peace treaty with the people of Syria and had collected from them the jizya and the tax for agrarian land Karaj, he was informed that the Romans were readying for battle against him and that the situation had become critical for him and the Muslims. Abu Ubaidah then wrote to the governors of the cities with whom pacts had been concluded that they must return the sums collected from Jia and Karaj and say to their subjects, "'We return to you your money because we have been informed that troops are being raised against us. In our agreement you stipulated that we protect you, but we are unable to do so. Therefore, we now return to you what we have taken from you, and we will abide by the stipulation and what has been written down, if God grants us victory over them." In accordance with this order, enormous sums were paid back out of the state treasury, and the Christians called down blessings on the heads of the Muslims, saying, May God give you rule over us again and make you victorious over the Romans. Had it been they, they would not have given us back anything, but would have taken all that remained with us. Similarly, during the time of the Crusades, Saladin returned the jizya to the Christians of Syria when he was compelled to retract from it. Moreover, the Christian tribe of al jurajima in the neighborhood of Antioch, made peace with the Muslims, promising to be their allies and fight on their side in battle, on condition that they should not be called upon to pay jizya and should receive their proper share of the booty. The Orientalist Thomas Walker Arnold writes that even Muslims were made to pay a tax if they were exempted from military service, like non-Muslims. Thus, the Shafi'i scholar Al-Khatib Ash-Sherbani states, "...military service is not obligatory for non-Muslims, especially for Dimas since they give jizya so that we protect and defend them, and not so that he defends us." Ibn Haha al-Asqalani states that there is a consensus amongst Islamic jurists that jizya is in exchange for military service. In the case of war, jizya is seen as an option to end hostilities. According to Abu Kalam Azad, one of the main objectives of jizya was to facilitate a peaceful solution to hostility, since non-Muslims who engaged in fighting against Muslims were thereby given the option of making peace by agreeing to pay jizya. In this sense, jizya is seen as a means by which to legalize the cessation of war and military conflict with non-Muslims. In a similar vein, Mahmud Shalchit states that, "...jiyya was never intended as payment in return for one's life or retaining one's religion, it was intended as a symbol to signify yielding, an end of hostility and a participation in shouldering the burdens of the state." The second rationale offered by Islamic scholars for the imposition of jizya tax on non-Muslims is that it was a substitute to the requirement of zakat tax from Muslims. Thirdly, jizya created a place for the inclusion of a non-Muslim dhimmi in a land owned and ruled by a Muslim, where routine payment of jizya was a tool of social stratification and treasury's revenue. Finally, jizya served as a reminder of subordination of a non-Muslim under Muslims, and created a financial and political incentive for Dimas to convert to Islam. The Muslim jurist and theologian Faq al-Din al-Razi suggested in his interpretation of Q929 that jizya is an incentive to convert. Taking it is not intended to preserve the existence of disbelief in the world. Rather, he argues, jizya allows the non-Muslim to live amongst Muslims and take part in Islamic civilization in the hope that the non-Muslim will convert to Islam. In the Quran Jizya is sanctioned by the Quran based on the following verse Fight those who believe not in God and in the last day, and who do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, and who follow not the religion of truth among those who were given the book, till they pay the jizya with a willing hand, being humbled. Tr. The study Quran 
fight those of the people of the book who do not truly believe in God and the last day, who do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, who do not behave according to the rule of justice, until they pay the tax and submit to it, tr. Abdul Halim 1. Fight those who believe not in God and the last day Muhammad Sa'id Ramadan al Bhuti says commenting on this verse, the verse commands Ketal and not Qatl, Qatl and it is known that there is a big distinction between these two words. For you say kataltu kortalt so and so if you initiated the fighting, while you say kataltu kat him if you resisted his effort to fight you by a reciprocal fight, or if you forestalled him in that so that he would not get at you unawares. Commenting on the Jia verse, Abu Hayyan states, they are so described because their way of acting is the way of those who do not believe in God, while Ahmad al Maragi comments on it. Fight those mentioned when the conditions which necessitate fighting are present, namely, aggression against you or your country, oppression and persecution against you on account of your faith, or threatening your safety and security, as was committed against you by the Byzantines, which was what led to Tabuk. Muhammad Abdul Halim writes that there is nothing in the Quran to say that not believing in God and the last day is in itself grounds for fighting anyone. Point two. Do not forbid what God and His Messenger have forbidden. W a la yuharimuna ma haram allahu w a rasula. The closest and most viable cause must relate to jiyya, that is, unlawfully consuming what belongs to the Muslim state, which, al Baydawi explains, it has been decided that they should give, since their own scriptures and prophets forbid breaking agreements and not paying what is due to others. His messenger in this verse has been interpreted by exegetes as referring to the Prophet Muhammad or the people of the book's own earlier messengers, Moses or Jesus. According to Abdul Halim, the latter must be the correct interpretation as it is already assumed that the people of the book did not believe in Muhammad or forbid what he forbade, so that they are condemned for not obeying their own prophet, who told them to honor their agreements. Point three. Who do not embrace the true faith, who do not behave according to the rule of justice a number of translators have rendered the text as, "...those who do not embrace the true faith, follow the religion of truth," or some variation thereof. Muhammad Abdul Halim argues against this translation, preferring instead to render Dain al as, "...rule of justice." The main meaning of the Arabic Dana is he obeyed, and one of the many meanings of Din is behavior al the famous Arabic lexicographer Feruzabadi d. 817 gives more than twelve meanings for the word din, placing the meaning worship of God, religion lower in the list. al mu jam al wasat gives the following definition. Dana is to be in the habit of doing something good or bad. Dana by something is to take it as a religion and worship God through it. Thus, when the verb dana is used in the sense of to believe or to practice a religion, it takes the preposition by after it, e.g., dana by al Islam, and this is the only usage in which the word means religion. The Jia verse does not say la yadanuna by dinil hakku, but rather la yadanuna dinil hakku. Abdul Halim thus concludes that the meaning that fits the Jia verse is thus those who do not follow the way of justice al i.e. by breaking their agreement and refusing to pay what is due. Point four. Until they pay Jia with their own hands hata yutu el jiata and yadin. Here and yad from, for, at hand, is interpreted by some to mean that they should pay directly, without intermediary and without delay. Others say that it refers to its reception by Muslims and means generously, as in with an open hand, since the taking of the jia is a form of munificence that averted a state of conflict. 
Al-Tabari gives only one explanation, that it means, "...from their hands to the hands of the receiver", just as we say, "...I spoke to him mouth to mouth". We also say, "...I gave it to him hand to hand". M. J. Kister understands and Yad to be a reference to the ability and sufficient means of the dhimmi. Similarly, Rashid Rida takes the word Yad in a metaphorical sense and relates the phrase to the financial ability of the person liable to pay Jia.5. While they are subdued Mark R. Cohen writes that while they are subdued was interpreted by many to mean humiliated state of the non-Muslims." According to Ziaruddin Ahmed, in the view of the majority of fuqaha Islamic jurists, the jia was levied on non-Muslims in order to humiliate them for their unbelief. In contrast, Abdul Halim writes that this notion of humiliation runs contrary to verses such as, do not dispute with the people of the book except in the best manner Q and the prophetic hadith, may God have mercy on the man who is liberal and easy-going when he buys, when he sells, and when he demands what is due to him. Al-Shafi'i, the founder of the Shafi'i school of law, wrote that a number of scholars explained this last expression to mean that, "...Islamic rulings are enforced on them." This understanding is reiterated by the Hanbali jurist Ibn Qayyim al jawtiya who interprets W.A. Hum Sajirin as making all subjects of the state obey the law and, in the case of the people of the book, pay the jiyya. Topic in the classical era. Topic <inaudible> liability and exemptions. Rules for liability and exemptions of jia formulated by jurists in the early Abbasid period appear to have remained generally valid thereafter. Islamic jurists required adult, free, sane, able bodied males of military age with no religious functions among the Dhimma community to pay the jia, while exempting women, children, elders, handicapped, monks, hermits, the poor, the ill, the insane, slaves, as well as Mustamans non Muslim foreigners who only temporarily reside in Muslim lands and converts to Islam. Dimas who chose to join military service were exempted from payment. If anyone could not afford this tax, they would not have to pay anything. Sometimes a dhimmi was exempted from jiyya if he rendered some valuable services to the state, the Hanafi scholar Abu Yusuf wrote. Slaves, women, children, the old, the sick, monks, hermits, the insane, the blind, and the poor, were exempt from the tax, and states that jia should not be collected from those who have neither income nor any property, but survive by begging and from alms. The Hanbali jurist Al Qadi Abu Yala states, There is no jia upon the poor, the old, and the chronically ill. Historical reports tell of exemptions granted by the second caliph Umar to an old blind Jew and others like him. The Maliki scholar al kurtubi writes that, "...there is a consensus amongst Islamic scholars that jia is to be taken only from heads of free men past puberty, who are the ones fighting, but not from women, the children, the slaves, the insane, and the dying old." The 13th century Shafi'i scholar al Nawawi wrote that a woman, a hermaphrodite, a slave even when partially enfranchised, a minor and a lunatic are exempt from jia. The 14th century Hanbali scholar Ibn Qayyim wrote, and there is no jia upon the aged, one suffering from chronic disease, the blind, and the patient who has no hope of recovery and has despaired of his health, even if they have enough." Ibn Qayyim adds, referring to the four Sunni madhabs, "...there is no jia on the kids, women and the insane. This is the view of the four imams and their followers." 
Ibn Mundir said, I do not know anyone to have differed with them. Ibn Qudama said in al Mughni, We do not know of any difference of opinion among the learned on this issue. In contrast, the Shafi'i jurist al Nawawi wrote, Our school insists upon the payment of the poll tax by sickly persons, old men, even if decrepit, blind men, monks, workmen, and poor persons incapable of exercising a trade. As for people who seem to be insolvent at the end of the year, the sum of the poll tax remained as debt to their account until they should become solvent. Abu Hanifa, in one of his opinions, and Abu Yusuf held that monks were subject to jiyya if they worked. Ibn Qayyim stated that the Dahir opinion of Ibn Hanbal is that peasants and cultivators were also exempted from jiyya, though jiyya was mandated initially for people of the book Judaism, Christianity, Sabianism, it was extended by Islamic jurists to all non-Muslims. Thus Muslim rulers in India, with the exception of Akbar, collected jiyya from Hindus, Buddhists, Jains and Sikhs under their rule. The sources of jiyya and the practices varied significantly over Islamic history. Shelomo Dov Goitin states that the exemptions for the indigent, the invalids and the old were no longer observed in the milieu reflected by the Cairo Geniza and were discarded even in theory by the Shafi'i jurists who were influential in Egypt at the time. According to Kristen A. Stilt, historical sources indicate that in Mamluk Egypt, poverty did not necessarily excuse the dhimmi from paying the tax, and boys as young as nine years old could be considered adults for tax purposes, making the tax particularly burdensome for large, poor families. Ashtar and Bornstein Makovetsky infer from Geniza documents that Jia was also collected in Egypt from the age of nine in the 11th century. <laughs> Rate of Jia tax The rates of jiyya were not uniform. By the time of Muhammad, the jiyya rate was one dinar per year imposed on male dhimmis in Medina, Mecca, Kaibar, Yemen, and Nidran and maximum of 12 dirhams under Akti name of Muhammad for St. Catherine's Monastery. According to Muhammad Hamidullah, the rate of 10 dirhams per annum represented the expenses of an average family for 10 days. Abu Yusuf, the chief qadi of the caliph Harun al-Rashid, states that there was no amount permanently fixed for the tax, though the payment usually depended on wealth. The Kitab al-Qaraj of Abu Yusuf sets the amounts at 48 dirhams for the richest, e.g., money changers, 24 for those of moderate wealth, and 12 for craftsmen and manual laborers. Moreover, it could be paid in kind if desired, cattle, merchandise, household effects, even needles were to be accepted in lieu of specie coins, but not pigs, wine, or dead animals. The jia varied in accordance with the affluence of the people of the region and their ability to pay. In this regard, Abu Ubaid ibn Salam comments that the Prophet imposed one dinar then worth ten or twelve dirhams upon each adult in Yemen. This was less than what Umar imposed upon the people of Syria and Iraq, the higher rate being due to the Yemenis' greater affluence and ability to pay. The rate of jiyya that were fixed and implemented by the second caliph of the Rashidun Caliphate, namely Umar bin al Khattab, during the period of his Khilafah, were small amounts four dirhams from the rich, two dirhams from the middle class, and only one dirham from the active poor who earned by working on wages, or by making or vending things. The 13th century scholar al-Nawawi writes, "...the minimum amount of the jiyya is one dinar per person per annum, but it is commendable to raise the amount, if it be possible to two dinars, for those possessed of moderate means, and to four for rich persons." Abu Ubaid insists that the dhimmis must not be burdened beyond their capacity, nor must they be caused to suffer. Ibn Qudamah narrates three views in what concerns the rates of jiyya. First, that it is a fixed amount that can't be changed, a view that is reportedly shared by Abu Hanifa and al Shafi'i. 
Secondly, that it is up to the Imam Muslim ruler to make itihad independent reasoning so as to decide whether to add or decrease. He gives the example of Umar making particular amounts for each class the rich, the middle class and the active poor. Finally, the third opinion considered the strict minimum to be one dinar, but gave no upper bound concerning the maximum amount. Ibn Khaldun states that jiyya has fixed limits that cannot be exceeded. In the classical manual of Shafi'i fiqh reliance of the traveler it is stated that t he minimum non-Muslim poll tax is 1 dinar n, 4.235 grams of gold per person a, per year. The maximum is whatever both sides agree upon. Topic: <laughs> Collection methods. Anne Lambton states that the jia was to be paid in humiliating conditions. NRG and other scholars state that some jurists required the jia to be paid by each in person, by presenting himself, arriving on foot not horseback, by hand, in order to confirm that he lowers himself to being a subjected one, and willingly pays. According to Mark R. Cohen, the Quran itself does not prescribe humiliating treatment for the dhimmi when paying jia, but some later Muslims interpreted it to contain an equivocal warrant for debasing the dhimmi non-Muslim through a degrading method of remission. In contrast, the 13th century hadith scholar and Shafi'ite jurist al Nawawi comments on those who would impose a humiliation along with the paying of the jiyya, stating, As for this aforementioned practice, I know of no sound support for it in this respect, and it is only mentioned by the scholars of Khurasan. The majority of scholars say that the jiyya is to be taken with gentleness, as one would receive a debt. The reliably correct opinion is that this practice is invalid and those who devised it should be refuted. It is not related that the Prophet or any of the rightly guided caliphs did any such thing when collecting the jia. Ibn Qudamah also rejected this practice and noted that Muhammad and the Rashidun caliphs encouraged that jia be collected with gentleness and kindness. The Maliki scholar al Qurtubi states, their punishment in case of non-payment of jia while they were able to do so is permitted however if their inability to pay it was clear then it isn't lawful to punish them since if one isn't able to pay the jia then he is exempted According to Abu Yusuf, jurist of the 5th Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid, those who didn't pay jiyya should be imprisoned and not be let out of custody until payment. However, the collectors of the jiyya were instructed to show leniency and avoid corporal punishment in case of non-payment. If someone had agreed to pay jiyya, leaving Muslim territory for enemy land was, in theory, punishable by enslavement if they were ever captured. This punishment did not apply if the person had suffered injustices from Muslims. Failure to pay the jiyya was commonly punished by house arrest, and some legal authorities allowed enslavement of dhimmis for non payment of taxes. In South Asia, for example, seizure of dhimmi families upon their failure to pay annual jiyya was one of the two significant sources of slaves sold in the slave markets of Delhi Sultanate and Mughal era. Topic: Use of jia tax. Jia was considered as one of the basic tax revenue for the early Islamic state, along with zakat, karaj, and others, and was collected by the Beit al-Mal, public treasury. Holger Weiss states that four fifths of the Fay revenue, that is jia and karaj, goes to the public treasury according to the Shafi'i madhab, whereas the Hanafi and Maliki madhabs state that the entire Fay goes to the public treasury. In theory, jia funds were distributed as salaries for officials, pensions to the army, and charity. Cahan states, but under this pretext, it was often paid into the prince's cas private treasury 
In later times, Jia revenues were commonly allocated to Islamic scholars so that they would not have to accept money from sultans whose wealth came to be regarded as tainted. Sources disagree about expenditure of Jia funds on non Muslims. Anne Lambton states that non Muslims had no share in the benefits from the public treasury derived from Jia. In contrast, according to several Muslim scholars, Islamic tradition records a number of episodes in which the second Caliph Umar stipulated that needy and infirm Dimas be supported from the Bayt al-Mal, which some authors hold to be representative of Islam. Evidence of Jia benefiting non-residents and temporary residents of an Islamic state, is found in the treaty Khalid bin al-Walid concluded with the people of al-Hira of Iraq, wherein any aged person who was weak, had lost his or her ability to work, fallen ill, or who had been rich but became poor, would be exempt from Jiaiza and his or livelihood and the livelihood of his or her dependents, who were not living permanently in the Islamic state, would be met by Bayt al Mal. Hassan Shah states that non-Muslim women, children, indigent, slaves, aren't only exempted from the payment of jia, but they are also helped by stipends from the public treasury when necessary. History Origins The history of the origins of the Jia is very complex for the following reasons Abbasid-era authors who systematized earlier historical writings, where the term Jia was used with different meanings, interpreted it according to the usage common in their own time, the system established by the Arab conquest was not uniform, but rather resulted from a variety of agreements or decisions. The earlier systems of taxation on which it was based are still imperfectly understood. William Montgomery Watt traces its origin to a pre Islamic practice among the Arabian nomads wherein a powerful tribe would agree to protect its weaker neighbors in exchange for a tribute, which would be refunded if the protection proved ineffectual. Jews and Christians in some southern and eastern areas of the Arabian Peninsula began to pay tribute, called jia, to the Islamic State during Muhammad. Muhammad's lifetime. It was not originally the poll tax it was to become later, but rather an annual percentage of produce and a fixed quantity of goods. During the Tabuk campaign of 630, Muhammad sent letters to four towns in the northern Hejaz and Palestine urging them to relinquish maintenance of a military force and rely on Muslims to ensure their security in return for payment of taxes. Moshe Gill argues that these texts represent the paradigm of letters of security that would be issued by Muslim leaders during the subsequent early conquests, including the use of the word jia, which would later take on the meaning of poll tax. Jia received divine sanction in 630 when the term was mentioned in a Quranic verse. 929. Max Bravman argues that the Quranic usage of the word jia develops a pre-Islamic common law principle which states that reward must necessarily follow a discretional good deed into a principle mandating that the life of all prisoners of war belonging to a certain category must be spared provided they grant the reward. Jia to be expected for an act of pardon. In 632, Jia in the form of a poll tax was first mentioned in a document reportedly sent by Muhammad to Yemen. W. Montgomery Watt has argued that this document was tampered with by early Muslim historians to reflect a later practice, while Norman Stillman holds it to be authentic. Emergence of classical taxation system Taxes levied on local populations in the wake of early Islamic conquests could be of three types, based on whether they were levied on individuals, on the land, or as collective tribute. During the first century of Islamic expansion, the words jia and karaj were used in all these three senses, with context distinguishing between individual and land taxes. Karaj on the head, jia on land, 
and vice versa. In the words of Dennett, since we are talking in terms of history, not in terms of philology, the problem is not what the taxes were called, but what we know they were. Regional variations in taxation at first reflected the diversity of previous systems. The Sasanian Empire had a general tax on land and a poll tax having several rates based on wealth, with an exemption for aristocracy. In Iraq, which was conquered mainly by force, Arabs controlled taxation through local administrators, keeping the graded poll tax, and likely increasing its rates to 1, 2 and 4 dinars. The aristocracy exemption was assumed by the new Arab Muslim elite and shared by local aristocracy by means of conversion. The nature of Byzantine taxation remains partly unclear, but it appears to have involved taxes computed in proportion to agricultural production or number of working inhabitants in population centers. In Syria and Upper Mesopotamia, which largely surrendered under treaties, taxes were calculated in proportion to the number of inhabitants at a fixed rate generally one dinar per head. They were levied as collective tribute in population centers which preserved their autonomy and as a personal tax on large abandoned estates, often paid by peasants in produce. In post-conquest Egypt, most communities were taxed using a system which combined a land tax with a poll tax of two dinars per head. Collection of both was delegated to the community on the condition that the burden be divided among its members in the most equitable manner. In most of Iran and Central Asia local rulers paid a fixed tribute and maintained their autonomy in tax collection, using the Sasanian dual tax system in regions like Khorasan, difficulties in tax collection soon appeared. Egyptian Copts, who had been skilled in tax evasion since Roman times, were able to avoid paying the taxes by entering monasteries, which were initially exempt from taxation, or simply by leaving the district where they were registered. This prompted imposition of taxes on monks and introduction of movement controls. In Iraq, many peasants who had fallen behind with their tax payments, converted to Islam and abandoned their land for Arab garrison cities in hope of escaping taxation. Faced with a decline in agriculture and a treasury shortfall, the governor of Iraq al-Hajjaj forced peasant converts to return to their lands and subjected them to the taxes again, effectively forbidding peasants to convert to Islam. In Khorasan, a similar phenomenon forced the native aristocracy to compensate for the shortfall in tax collection out of their own pockets, and they responded by persecuting peasant converts and imposing heavier taxes on poor Muslims. The situation where conversion to Islam was penalized in an Islamic state could not last, and the devout Umayyad caliph Umar II has been credited with changing the taxation system. Modern historians doubt this account, although details of the transition to the system of taxation elaborated by Abbasid-era jurists are still unclear. Umar II ordered governors to cease collection of taxes from Muslim converts, but his successors obstructed this policy. Some governors sought to stem the tide of conversions by introducing additional requirements such as undergoing circumcision and the ability to recite passages from the Quran. According to Hoyland, taxation-related grievances of non-Arab Muslims contributed to the opposition movements which resulted in the Abbasid Revolution. In contrast, Dennett states that it is incorrect to postulate an economic interpretation of the Abbasid Revolution. The notion of an Iranian population staggering under a burden of taxation and ready to revolt at the first opportunity, as imagined by Gerloff van Vlauten, will not bear the light of careful investigation. He continues, under the new system that was eventually established, Karaj came to be regarded as a tax levied on the land, regardless of the taxpayer's religion. The poll tax was no longer levied on Muslims, but treasury did not necessarily suffer and converts did not gain as a result, since they had to pay zakat, which was instituted as a compulsory tax on Muslims around 730. 
The terminology became specialized during the Abbasid era, so that Karaj no longer meant anything more than land tax, while the term Jia was restricted to the poll tax on Dimas. <inaudible> India In India, Islamic rulers imposed jia on non-Muslims starting with the 11th century. The taxation practice included jia and karaj taxes. These terms were sometimes used interchangeably to mean poll tax and collective tribute, or just called karaj o jia. Jia expanded with Delhi Sultanate. Ayla al Din Khalji, a sultan of the Khalji dynasty who ruled over most of north, west, and parts of eastern India, from 1296 to 1316 AD, legalized the enslavement of the Jia and Karaj defaulters. His officials seized and sold these slaves in growing sultanate cities where there was a great demand of slave labor. The Muslim court historian Ziaruddin Barani recorded that Qazi Mughisuddin of Bayana advised Ayla al Din that Islam requires imposition of jia on Hindus, to show contempt and to humiliate the Hindus, and imposing jia is a religious duty of the Sultan. During the early 14th century reign of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, expensive invasions across India and his order to attack China by sending a portion of his army over the Himalayas emptied the precious metal in Sultanate's treasury. He ordered minting of coins from base metals with face value of precious metals. This economic experiment failed because Hindus in his Sultanate minted counterfeit coins from base metal in their homes, which they then used for paying jia. In the late 14th century, mentions the memoir of Tughlaq dynasty's Sultan Firoz Shah Tughlaq, his predecessor taxed all Hindus but had exempted all Hindu Brahmins from Jia, Firoz Shah extended it over all Hindus. He also announced that any Hindus who converted to Islam would become exempt from taxes and Jia as well as receive gifts from him. On those who chose to remain Hindus, he raised jia tax rate. In Kashmir, Sikandar Butsakan levied both jia and zakat on Hindus. Ahmad Shah, 1411-1442, a ruler of Gujarat, introduced the jia in 1414 and collected it with such strictness that many people converted to Islam to evade it. Jia was abolished by the third Mughal emperor Akbar in 1564. It was finally abolished in 1579. However, Aurangzeb, the sixth emperor, reintroduced and levied jia on non-Muslims in 1679. His goal was to promote Islam and weaken the Hindu religion. Aurangzeb ordered that the collected jia be used for charitable causes to support the increasing number of impoverished and unemployed Muslim clerics in his empire. Hindus were outraged and numerous small-scale revolts resulted. The jia rate was more than twice the zakat tax rate paid by Muslims, which led to mass civil protests of 1679 in India. He imposed it on monks and beggars as well. In some areas revolts led to its periodic suspension such as the 1704 AD suspension of jia in Deccan region of India by Aurangzeb. Sicily After the Norman conquest of Sicily, taxes imposed on the Muslim minority were also called the jia locally spelled gizia. This poll tax was a continuation of the jia imposed on non-Muslims in Sicily, by Muslim rulers in the 11th century, before the Norman conquest. Ottoman Empire Jia collected from Christian and Jewish communities was among the main sources of tax income of the Ottoman treasury. In some regions, such as Lebanon and Egypt, Jia was payable collectively by the Christian or the Jewish community, and was referred to as Maktu. In these cases, the individual rate of Jia tax would vary, as the community would pitch in for those who could not afford to pay. <laughs> 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 
Topic: <inaudible> Abolition. In Persia, Jia was paid by Zoroastrian minority until 1884, when it was removed by pressure on the Qayyar government from the Persian Zoroastrian Amelioration Fund. The Jia was eliminated in Algeria and Tunisia in the 19th century, but continued to be collected in Morocco until the first decade of the 20th century. These three dates coincide with the French colonization of these countries. The Ottoman Empire abolished the Gia. in 1856. It was replaced with a new tax, which non-Muslims paid in lieu of military service. It was called Badal Askari lit. Military substitution", a tax exempting Jews and Christians from military service. The Jews of Kurdistan, according to the scholar Mordecai Zakhan, preferred to pay the Badal tax in order to redeem themselves from military service. Only those incapable of paying the tax were drafted into the army. Zakhan says that paying the tax was possible to an extent also during the war and some Jews paid 50 gold liras every year during World War I according to Zakhan. In spite of the forceful conscription campaigns, some of the Jews were able to buy their exemption from conscription duty. Zakhan states that the payment of the battle Askari during the war was a form of bribe that bought them at most a one-year deferment. <laughs> Recent times The Jia is no longer imposed by Muslim states. Nevertheless, there have been reports of non-Muslims in areas controlled by the Pakistani Taliban and ISIS being forced to pay the jizya. In 2009, it was claimed that a group of militants that referred to themselves as the Taliban imposed the jizya on Pakistan's minority Sikh community after occupying some of their homes and kidnapping a Sikh leader. In 2014, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant ISIL announced that it intended to extract Jia from Christians in the city of Raqqa, Syria, which it controlled. Christians who refused to pay the tax would have to either convert to Islam or die. Wealthy Christians would have to pay the equivalent of USD $664 twice a year, poorer ones would be charged one-fourth that amount. In June, the Institute for the Study of War reported that ISIL claims to have collected the Fay, i.e., Jia and Karaj. The late Islamic scholar Abul Ala Mordudi, of Pakistan, said that Jia should be re imposed on non Muslims in a Muslim nation. Yusuf al Karadawi of Egypt also held that position in the mid 1980s, however, he later reconsidered his legal opinion on this point, stating, in our days, after military conscription has become compulsory for all citizens—Muslims and non-Muslims—there is no longer room for any payment, whether by name of Jia or any other." According to Khalid Abu Lfadl, moderate Muslims generally reject the Dhimma system, which encompasses Jia, as inappropriate for the age of nation-states and democracies. Topic. Assessment and historical context Some authors have characterized the complex of land and poll taxes in the pre Abbasid era and implementation of the Jia poll tax in early modern South Asia as discriminatory and or oppressive, and the majority of Islamic scholars, amongst whom are al-Nawawi and Ibn Qudamar, have criticized humiliating aspects of its collection as contrary to Islamic principles. Discriminatory regulations were utilized by many pre-modern polities. However, W. Cleveland and M. Bunton assert that Dimmer status represented an unusually tolerant attitude for the era and stood in marked contrast to the practices of the Byzantine Empire. They add that the change from the Byzantine and Persian rule to Arab rule lowered taxes and allowed Dimmers to enjoy a measure of communal autonomy. According to Bernard Lewis, available evidence suggests that the change from Byzantine to Arab rule was 
welcomed by many among the subject peoples, who found the new yoke far lighter than the old, both in taxation and in other matters. Ira Lapidus writes that the Arab Muslim conquests followed a general pattern of nomadic conquests of settled regions, whereby conquering peoples became the new military elite and reached a compromise with the old elites by allowing them to retain local political, religious, and financial authority. Peasants, workers, and merchants paid taxes, while members of the old and new elites collected them. Payment of various taxes, the total of which for peasants often reached half of the value of their produce, was not only an economic burden, but also a mark of social inferiority. Norman Stillman writes that although the tax burden of the Jews under early Islamic rule was comparable to that under previous rulers, Christians of the Byzantine Empire, though not Christians of the Persian Empire, whose status was similar to that of the Jews, and Zoroastrians of Iran shouldered a considerable heavier burden in the immediate aftermath of the Arab conquests. He writes that escape from oppressive taxation and social inferiority was a «great inducement» to conversion and flight from villages to Arab garrison towns, and many converts to Islam were sorely disappointed when they discovered that they were not to be permitted to go from being tribute bearers to pension receivers by the ruling Arab military elite. Before their numbers forced an overhaul of the economic system in the 8th century, the influence of Jia on conversion has been a subject of scholarly debate. Julius Wellhausen held that the poll tax amounted to so little that exemption from it did not constitute sufficient economic motive for conversion. Similarly, Thomas Arnold states that Gia was too moderate to constitute a burden, seeing that it released them from the compulsory military service that was incumbent on their Muslim fellow subjects. He further adds that converts escaping taxation would have to pay the legal arms, zakat, that is annually levied on most kinds of movable and immovable property. Other early 20th century scholars suggested that non Muslims converted to Islam en masse in order to escape the poll tax, but this theory has been challenged by more recent research. Daniel Dennett has shown that other factors, such as desire to retain social status, had greater influence on this choice in the early Islamic period. According to Halil Anolchik, the wish to avoid paying the jizya was an important incentive for conversion to Islam in the Balkans, though Anton Minkoff has argued that it was only one among several motivating factors. Mark R. Cohen writes that despite the humiliating connotations and the financial burden, the jizya paid by Jews under Islamic rule provided a surer guarantee of protection from non-Jewish hostility than that possessed by Jews in the Latin West, where Jews paid numerous and often unreasonably high and arbitrary taxes in return for official protection, and where treatment of Jews was governed by charters which new rulers could alter at will upon accession or refuse to renew altogether. The Pact of Umar, which stipulated that Muslims must do battle to guard the dimas and put no burden on them greater than they can bear, was not always upheld, but it remained a steadfast cornerstone of Islamic policy. Into early modern times, Yasser Elithi states that the insignificant amount of the jia, as well as its progressive structure and exemptions, leave no doubt that it was not imposed to persecute people or force them to convert. Niaz A. Shah states that jia is partly symbolic and partly commutation for military service. As the amount is insignificant and exemptions are many, the symbolic nature predominates. The French polymath Gustave Le Bon wrote, that despite the fact that the incidence of taxation fell more heavily on a Muslim than a non Muslim, the non Muslim was free to enjoy equally well with every Muslim all the privileges afforded to the citizens of the state. 
Muhammad Abdul Halim states, T. Hijia is a very clear example of the acceptance of a multiplicity of cultures within the Islamic system, which allowed people of different faiths to live according to their own faiths, all contributing to the well-being of the state, Muslims through zakat, and the Ahl al dimma through jiyya. See also Dimi Karaj Leibzol Ottoman millet system Rav Aksazi Taxation of the Jews Tolerance tax